This week on ANN, Adventist Health and Montemorelos University participate in a bicycle donation to boost physical activity in Mexico. King's Kids, a program for children in the South Pacific, celebrates 100 episodes. And later, an Adventist filmmaker supports a jungle school with only social media funding. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, Adventist Health and World Vision International recently donated dozens of bicycles to help middle school and high school students in North Mexico. The project, called Bicycles That Change Lives, aims to reduce school dropout rates and encourage physical activity. Students will use the bicycles for commuting to and from school for the, and for general recreation. Adventist Health facilitated the delivery of more than 110 bicycles in coordinated efforts with leaders of Montemorelos University and Adventist University in Mexico, as well as municipal leaders of General Tehran, Allende, and Montemorelos districts in the Nuevo Leon state in December 2021. An additional 250 bicycles will be delivered this month with five more deliveries planned throughout the year. Representatives from the health and education sectors of the Mexican state government, Montemorelos University, municipal mayors of each region, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North Mexico attended special events to mark the distribution of the first bicycles. Global Mission System Lead for Adventist Health, John Schroer, said, Our goal is to build strong and healthy communities. It is very exciting for us to see the beginning of this program, and we look to the future to bring other programs to these communities. To qualify for a bicycle, students must be enrolled in the current school year, have limited resources, have no other means of transportation, have a history of good school behavior, and meet a specified grade point average during the last school period. The recent Adventist Health donation included a 26-foot cargo truck provided by Adventist Health Rideout that will facilitate distribution of the bicycles as well as medical supplies for Adventist Health Clinic partners throughout northern Mexico. An Australian-produced children's show that has brought the story of Jesus into the homes of thousands of families around the world is celebrating its 100th episode. The King's Kids will celebrate the milestone with a special premiere of the 100th episode next Friday evening, February 18. Notching 100 episodes is a significant achievement for the King's Kids, which is in a, a collaboration between Adventist Media, Abide Family Ministries, and the South Pacific Division. The program was launched in 2020 to assist and minister to families during the first extended COVID-19 lockdown. Since then, it has become an international hit, broadcast in more than 70 countries worldwide, filling a gap in quality Christian TV content for children. Kimberly Huliston, director for Abide Family Ministries, which produces the program, says, Reaching our 100th episode is a real God moment. This is his program created to support children and families particularly during the stresses and challenges of navigating life during these turbulent times. Created to go hand in hand with this Grace Link Primary Children's Sabbath School lessons, the King's Kids features puppets, balloon animals, singing, crafts, storytelling, health and nature segments. Eight series have been produced since the first episode. Calm in the Storm launched on May 28, 2020. Series one has been translated into Romanian, and a Vietnamese pilot program has also been created. Huliston also said the group is working on a special three series program, which will have more of an evangelism focus addressing children and families who do not know anything about Jesus. The new series is being created in conjunction with Hope Channel, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and Abide Family Ministries. For more information and to watch episodes of King's Kids, visit discover.hopechannel.com slash the King's Kids. Congratulations to Loma Linda University Medical Center, Murrieta, and Loma Linda University Children's Hospital, who have been named to U.S. News and World Report's 2021 to 22 Best Hospitals for Maternity list. The report highlighted their national ranking with low rates of newborn complications, early deliveries, and C-section rates. 
Jennifer Ross, Director of Perinatal Services from Lumbia University Medical Center, Morietta, said their team is honored to be acknowledged as one of the best maternity care hospitals in the country. She said, we have talented and dedicated staff who enjoy serving our growing community every day and will continue to ensure our patients receive the best possible care and outcomes. Out of 2,700 hospitals nationwide evaluated on their maternity services, Morietta and Children's Hospital were two out of only 237 hospitals that earned recognition in early December on their high performance. With U.S. News and World Report's first release of a Best Hospitals Fraternity Report, they stated that after more than 30 years of evaluating the best health system in the United States, they hope this inaugural edition will help expecting families make well-informed decisions for their health care. Focusing on quality in their evaluation, U.S. News and World Report examined each hospital's data on uncomplicated pregnancies, not high-risk pregnancies, and five different factors, scheduled early deliveries, C-section rates in low-risk women, newborn complications, rate of exclusive breast milk feeding, options for vaginal births after cesarean. Participating hospital profiles also included various relevant information on services and amenities such as private rooms, valet parking, and availability of child birthing classes. Terry Greer was an elementary school teacher in the U.S. state of Florida whose COVID battle caught national attention. After his recovery, Coach Greer, as his students call him, came back to thank the doctors, nurses, and staff at Advent Health for their care for him during his time in the hospital. Advent Health sent this report about Greer's miraculous recovery and return to the hospital. Oftentimes, patients who recover after long hospital stays are discharged, and it's the last time their clinical teams ever really hear about them or see them. But every once in a while, they come back to say thanks in person. You may remember Terry Greer's story. He's a local elementary school teacher whose students call him Coach Beard. His COVID fight at Advent Health Orlando made worldwide headlines in 2020. Recently, he asked to meet with his care team. Senior videographer Dave Harrison shows you the touching moments. Hi there. Holy cow. <laughs> How are you? I am fantastic. Thanks wow. to you. Wow. <laughs> Thanks to it's you. It's so nice to see you. I ended up at ORMC getting treated for COVID. Last I remember, I was in a room and I woke up. I was in Advent Health uh, a month and a half later. It's been a year since I was on uh, the ECMO machine. I just wanted to come back and say thank you. I just wanted to, to come personally and thank you um, for saving my life. He was dying. Without the ability to treat him the way we did, uh, he would have died. He was at the end of his ability for regular treatment to work. It's nice to see you, hello. It's good to see you. Without you, <laughs> he would not be here. I wanted to just say, look at me now. When you saw me the first time, I was in a bed. I was a mess, and, at 90. and now I'm here talking with the doctors and, and nurses, and they can see what their work on the outcome. I'm here now. To feel the gratitude and to be part of that, to know that we have impacted uh, a family in such a positive way is, is an incredible feeling. I mean, it's, it's cliche to say words can't describe, but but it, it also, for myself and all of my team, it makes what we do and the sacrifices and the risk we take, it makes it worthwhile. Coming up, a filmmaker from Philippines makes a big impact. We'll be right back after the break. Any idea what time it is? We really, really need our sleep. Are you from? No, we're not from the future, but we know you only pay attention to yourselves, so here we are. But how? We have no time for that. We have less than 30 seconds. Fact number one, adults need seven hours of sound, restful sleep to keep their immune systems healthy and to fight viruses. And today, right now, is the single most important thing you can do to keep yourself healthy. What are you doing? We're just Googling if spicy foods cause hallucinations. 
fact too, staring at your phone or your computer right before bed prevents sound sleep. And you'll be tired the next day. Ain't nobody got time for that. Can we just go to bed, please? Welcome back. Jasper Ivan Ituriaga is a filmmaker who has a passion for reaching the unreached. He's also a missionary, pastor, landscaper, photographer, and content creator. He goes around the world capturing great moments and imparting inspiration through the content he shares. During the pandemic, Ituriaga went to Brooks Point, Padawan to visit some missionary friends who work for the Philippine Adventist Medical Aviation Services, an independent ministry that supports the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In particular, it extends medical help to people living in remote communities in the Philippines. After spending a few days in the mission field, immersing himself in the culture and connecting with families and kids, Ituriaga realized the great need for education in the community. It was then that the idea of building a jungle school funded entirely by social media hit him. Ituriaga worked on this dream with the Medical Aviation Services team. To present this idea to his audience, Ituriaga started filming all the work done by the team in the jungle for medical missions and volunteer teachers, teaching kids under the trees to doing medical evacuation for those who needed immediate health assistance. All of this went straight to Ituriaga's social media account, where they sparked curiosity among his audience. A day after launching the Jungle School Initiative, Ituriaga and the team were surprised to know they had already surpassed their goal of needed support. As soon as they received some of the funds, Ituriaga and the team started working on the design and planning how to transport the materials from the city to the jungle. Adventist Medical Aviation Services airlifted the construction materials Fathers worked together at the school site, mothers prepared food, children cleared land, everyone played a role in building the school. In three months, the school was established. The Jungle School is now up and running. For the community, it's not just a school, but a place where they can grow and build hope for themselves and their families. Jasper shares more about the project through his video blog. He has given us permission to share this report. Hi, my name is Jasper. I'm a filmmaker and a travel photographer. I've been traveling around the world, filming and photographing people's life in different perspectives. My passion for telling stories brought me here in Palawan. And I tell you, it's been one of the craziest, overwhelming, awe-inspiring experiences. For the past few weeks, I have been with my friend Daniel, who is a paramedic and a helicopter pilot. I have been documenting him for the past few weeks doing medical evacs and supply runs for different jungle schools around the mountains of Palawan, Philippines. During one of my trips, I came across a jungle school run by a local teacher named Jilin. Jilin is a native here and is a product of one of the jungle schools. Man, I was so inspired to see how she dedicated her life to serving her own people. I mean, she could have gone the other way and chose a greener pasture. But she looked back and did what is best for her people. The school? It was not the kind of school you might be thinking of. But the children there, oh man, they value the place because they learn so much. They grow, they meet friends, and they learn from teacher Jilin. I'm gonna make a separate vlog about her soon, so please don't forget to subscribe. After our visit to the jungle school, we went back to the hangar, had our dinner, and boom, it dawned on me. Why not make a school fueled and supported by social media? So I talked to the organization I'm with called Philippine Adventist Medical Aviation Services, and they told me there's a village that is really interested to have a school. When we got there, we provided medical and dental care for the community. We distributed food for the families. We also provided some slippers for the kids. Children there go up and down the mountains, crossing rivers and marching in muddy landscapes barefoot. I'm not sure how these kids can bear the rough mountain surface, but I tell you, they have the most genuine smiles despite all the things they don't have. 
With all the things we brought them, I know it will not be enough. Looking at these children's faces, their smile hid a greater need. These kids are growing. They need a foundation that will support them as they mature, and these kids know it. They know exactly what to do. The problem is the nearest school takes hours and hours of walk to reach. This reality hit me big time, and I was impressed by the idea that there needs to be a way to make school closer to home. I know this sounds crazy, but I felt this urgency in my heart that we need a jungle school right here, right now, in this village. For me, it sounded impossible and a little bit too ambitious, but the village wanted it. And we already had two teachers who was ready to be deployed and all we need is a building. So I opened this idea in my Instagram and posted a GoFundMe account. This will blow your mind. In less than 24 hours, we achieved our goal. We even overreached our goal. Crazy, right? This video is supposed to be a fundraiser video, but I guess it, this will end up as a thank you video. Guys, thank you so much for helping out. In behalf of the village, the team, the kids, thank you so much for supporting this cause. I never thought this would be possible, but you guys made this possible. It is because of you that we are actually starting a social media funded jungle school. The money will cover the school building and a year stipend for two volunteer teachers. Other funds raised will go towards the maintenance costs, supplies, feeding the kids, medical and dental missions for the community. I know we've already met our goal, but if you still wanna donate, we still wanna make more and more jungle schools just like this. Pamas has already built three different jungle schools around the mountains of Brooks Point. We can still help them by providing them solar panels, laptops, and even printers for these teachers. If you wanna be part of this movement, please visit our GoFundMe account or send me a direct message. I can't wait to start this school. I can't wait to see the kids running to the school, smiling, singing, listening to the teacher, learning a lot of things. This is the first ever school in this village and you guys get to be part of this. How awesome is that? We can't cure all the problems here in the mountains, but we wanted to ease our indigenous friends' pain just a little bit. I wanted to bring hope to the children here and give them opportunities to have a better future. I can't do this by myself. We need to do this together for the kids and for the future. Thank you guys for listening to this vlog. This will be just the first jungle vlog that I'll be making. I'll be making more of these stories around the jungles of Brooks Point, Palawan. So please subscribe, watch out for the next episode, and see you next time. To know more about the jungle schools in Palawan, you can visit at PSTR Jasper on Instagram. Coming up, David Trim is here for this week in Adventist history. But up next, Adventist Mission has a story of a young missionary in Indonesia. We may look, pray, read, think, worship, sing, and share differently, but we all look forward to the Sabbath, and we all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. With this message in mind, we arrived at a core component for a new identity system, the creation grid, a simple seven column structure for layout. The grid is a reference both to the prophetic timeline as well as to the creation week that culminated in the seventh day Sabbath. The first six columns of the grid belong to the designer. It can be filled with anything, text, images, illustrations, patterns, and logos. But the seventh column, the Sabbath column, does not belong to them. It is meant to be different and special. Regardless of what or where you are designing, you can always find information to help you communicate that we are all Seventh-day Adventists.
Welcome back. Every Sabbath morning, Anita and her family made the long drive to a small village in Indonesia to attend the mission church there. Even though she had to wake up early, Anita loved to play and worship with the children. She was happy to be a missionary kid. Adventist Mission has more. Happy Sabbath! A voice cut through the darkness. Anita stirred in her bed. Rise and shine, sunshine! Her father said, poking his head into the door of Anita's bedroom. It was four o'clock in the morning. Anita's eyes popped open. It was time to get up. After breakfast, Anita put on her favorite Sabbath dress. Then she slipped her bare feet into flip-flops. She gave her Sabbath shoes to her mother to put in a bag. Now she was ready for the trip to church. Anita climbed into the back seat of the family's white van. Her father slid behind the wheel and Pastor Kamu took a seat beside him. Anita's mother sat with her in the back and they were joined by five university students. Nearly every Sabbath, her parents traveled to new churches in Indonesia to speak about Jesus. At five o'clock, the van left the campus of Mount Klabat University, the Seventh-day Adventist school in Indonesia where Anita's father and mother were teaching as missionaries. The sky was dark and few cars were on the street, but her father still had to be careful as he drove. He steered around sleeping dogs and sometimes had to stop for cows that were crossing the road. Anita slept on her mother's lap. About an hour and a half later, Anita awoke as the van came to a stop. She liked this part of the trip to church. She and the others boarded a small motorboat and soon they were cruising on the ocean. Anita looked across the dark blue water. Light was just beginning to crack on the horizon as the sun rose. Warm, humid air rushed against her cheeks as the boat navigated gentle waves. After an hour, the boat docked on an island and the group transferred to another boat for a 30-minute ride. Then they landed on yet another island dotted with coconut trees amid a lush green jungle. Anita was glad that she had worn her flip-flops and not her nice Sabbath shoes because she liked feeling the mud between her toes as she walked along the trail. About 45 minutes later, Anita saw a small village with a Seventh-day Adventist church. Sabbath school would begin soon and the church was already crowded with people. The people greeted Anita and the others with delight. Grandfathers and grandmothers smiled broadly. Fathers and mothers beamed with joy. They were so happy to welcome the visitors. They knew that it had taken effort to reach their village. Little children waved excitedly at Anita and clustered around her. A little girl ran up and pinched the white skin of Anita's arm. A little boy nervously reached out his arm and tugged on her red hair. The village children had brown skin and black hair, and this was their first time seeing anyone who looked like Anita. Inside the church, her mother pulled Anita's Sabbath shoes from the bag and Anita slipped them on. Now she felt ready to worship God. Later that afternoon, Anita put her flip-flops back on for the long trip home. She was tired but happy. Every Sabbath, the long trip to a new church was an adventure. Best of all, every Sabbath, Anita got to worship God. Anita liked being a missionary kid. This story happened nearly 40 years ago, but missionary kids today still make adventurous trips to church thanks to your World Mission offerings. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org, then click on videos at the top. And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, the star of Adventist Healthcare in Peru. Welcome to This Week in Seventh-day Adventist History. On February 13, 1949, Clinica Adventista de Miraflores, 
an Adventist hospital opened in Miraflores, a suburb of Lima, the capital city of Peru. The hospital originated in October 1946 when the Inca Union Committee voted to rent a large house in the San Antonio district of Miraflores for a five-bed institution under the direction of a missionary doctor, Clayton R. Potts. You see Dr. Potts here with his wife, Molly. In March 1948, the small clinic was moved to a building that had been purchased with $20,000 contributed by the General Conference. During 1948, this building was remodeled and adapted for use as a hospital, as which it opened 72 years ago this week. Today, it still operates under the name of Good Hope Clinic and is a hospital with 111 beds, which in 2020 treated 158,000 patients. On February 19 in 1897, the 32nd General Conference session opened in College View, Nebraska, with 140 delegates in attendance. It was the first time the session had convened outside Battle Creek since the 1888 session in Minneapolis. In 1897, a new president was elected, with George A. Irwin, who you see in this photo, replacing Ola A. Olson, who had been president since 1888. This 32nd session was unusual in that all three officers were replaced at once. Secretary Leroy T. Nicola was replaced by Louis Azariah Hoops, who you see here, while the treasurer, William H. Edwards, was replaced by Anderson G. Adams, who in later life was to leave the church. Edwards and Nicola had both served four years in their offices, and their successors, Hoops and Adams, likewise were elected to two two-year terms. This turnover in 1897 reflected increasing concern about the direction of the church's foreign mission program, and what calls were made at the 1897 session for organizational reform. However, Irwin's administration was somewhat ineffective. Not until 1901 was the church reorganized in the interests of worldwide mission at the famous 34th session. And that was this week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch ANN video, ANN in depth, and plenty other amazing videos on prophecy, health, and Bible study? Just go to YouTube and search for The Adventist Church. Click the subscribe button to make sure you're caught up each week. And remember, leave a comment or a prayer request. We have people who are praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from Psalm 23, verse 6. The passage says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.